my other meeting set up as automatic record, but did not automatically record this one. So let's go up and just show this on the screen since we just started recording. Thank you, Sandra. I need to change my default settings. Zoom has been working really hard at like upgrading things and having the new settings um, to make it more secure. And I think I need to check that so it automatically records. Okay, let me pull up uh, what would be a good, maybe just a, the Desmos, they have a regular scientific calculator. Okay, it was two times, this is a really long number here. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. And let's see here, then that was divided by, it was three times 10 to the eighth, but that was squared. <laughs> and then times 1.99 times 10 to the 30th. So that's 2,949.6. But then I think, I feel like that answer is wrong because I think that's what it had for the answer. Oh my, sorry, I can't open. Yeah, you have to convert, right? But I think it had the answer. I think that's what this would have had for the answer. But this is this is meters. This is meters per year. So we'll say 2,000. We'll just round 2,950. Um, in real scientific work here, um, you have three digits here. 1.99. This was really 3.00, uh, 6.67. So you should really only round to three digits in your answer too. But that's meters per year. So I believe it would be 2.95 kilometers per year. But I feel like I checked the answer uh, for a couple of students and it was the 2,900 whatever. But I don't think that's right. I think that's meters per year. But I, I opened up the solutions and it like froze on me. Um, sorry, the screen went black there. I'm trying to, where did it go? It like totally froze on me. Oh, I can't even, where did it go? That's so weird. I can't even find the Adobe client to close it. I don't even know. Sorry. Let me try again. Love these technical issues, huh? Okay, let's try this again. All right, opening and I'm open. Okay, 4.1, I have all the answers. Every single one, but I'm a little concerned about this one. So let's take a look. Let's see what the textbook author says here. Ah, okay. All right, we are good. I'm gonna paste this in for you. So it looks like we were good, Two point, about 2.95 kilometers per year. Uh, that's part A. And then uh, part B, by what percent does the event horizon change per year? And I'm just going to show the key here for this one since we already have it up. So the percent change will be the change in radius divided by the actual radius. And so you'll notice what they did is they said, well, using differentials, that's approximately equal to the magnitude of the differential over the magnitude of the radius. And simplifying that, that's just the change in mass. Professor Kramer? Black. Yes. We can't see. The screen is black. Oh, the screen is black. All right, let me stop share and then share again. Thank you for letting me know. Do, 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 do.
All right, anything now? That's cool. Yes, it's, it's working now. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So here we have, um, I pasted in the key for this. So we have the key or the, the solution for this and we were right. And we, once we converted, so it's 2,949, whatever, that's meters per year. So that's about 2.95 kilometers per year. So we were good there. Uh, for the part B where it says uh, what the percent error is, that would be um, the change in radius over the actual radius. That's the percent. Um, and so using differentials, you can say that's approximately equal to the differential dr over the radius. And they, you can take a screenshot of this or whatever. I'll pause this if you want to write it down. They're just taking the differential formula over the formula for the radius and simplifying. And all you get is actually you end up with the differential dm, the change in mass, divided by uh, the mass. Uh, that differential, if r is equal to 2g over c squared times m, well then dr, the 2g over is, is constant, the c is constant, and then it would just be dm. So that's how they got that, that numerator there. And then just dividing by the original r, all the g's and c's simplify, you're left with just dm over the, over the mass, the change in mass over the mass. Wow, the mass is 10 billion suns. <laughs> Gosh. So um, the thing that is most difficult about this particular one that I don't wanna stress you out with too much is this one is more about the units and these crazy big numbers. The actual rate of change, finding the related rate is relatively simple. If we go up to our work again, it's relatively simple because this G and C, they're just constants. So all we have is R equal to some number times M. And so dr dt is just that number times dm dt. It's just that the numbers here are crazy, right? Crazy big numbers. So I know a couple of people had asked about 46. Um, Sorry about the black screen in the middle there. Does anyone have any additional questions about number 46? Yeah, this one was on the homework list. Double checking my homework list here. Yeah, 4.1 number 46. So this one was on the homework list. Um, We'll ask for more homework questions. Before that, uh, Brittany had asked earlier in the chat about the next quiz. And what we'll do after class on Thursday, I will post uh, the quiz in D2L. I'll post it as a PDF, and you can have until the end of the day on Thursday to turn that in. It'll be the same thing. You know, use your picture, use your phone. Um, please try to get it in a PDF form because you can get a single document. For those that got your graded exams back, the ones that were pictures, like I had to download all those pictures, merge them all together into a PDF. The quality isn't as good, it's harder to see comments. Um, it's much easier to see the comments when they're in, um, when it's in PDF form. So I would encourage you to try that. Maybe, you know, the little bit of a learning curve now, but once we get it up and running, um, I think that'll be helpful. So, so yeah, it'll be posted after class and then, uh, it'll be due to the Dropbox by the end of the day. And I have that, I have that drafted all ready to go. And so I'll have that automatically pop up after our homework question time on Thursday. And that's um, for one, two, and three. One, two, and three. So one related rate question, maybe one question for four, two, one question for four, three. Um, one of the things that I'm struggling with because of the change in modality is I, I'm worried about having odd numbered homework questions um, on the quiz because you have your homework right there and I know it would just be really tempting to just look at your homework and it's hard because it's right there. So I think what I'm going to do instead um, is 
make it a open homework quiz, but use like similar even problems. So if 23 was assigned and 25 was assigned, I might put number 24 on there uh, from that section. So in the instructions, what I put is that it's actually open homework. You can have your homework notebook open, um, but then it won't be question, questions directly from the homework. I think that worked fine when we were in class, but just at home, it's just hard. Like you're like, you know, you get stuck. You're like, oh, I remember I, I did this one. I'm just gonna take a look. And it's hard to resist that pull. And so I just kind of want to make you not feel the pull. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that. So you can just have your homework open and we'll kind of try that and see how that goes. And I might do a little survey after that, maybe post a survey on Friday and say, hey, how did that quiz go? Did that, was that procedure good? We'll kind, of, we'll kind of see how that goes. So that's my plan for this quiz and for the future quizzes. I think that'll be a good way to do those. Um, all right, other homework questions. Does anyone have any additional homework questions? I've got the book up here. And so we can go over any from 41, 42, or 43. Uh, Sandra, is that from 47 or from, um, from 41 still? From 4.1. All right, 47 was not assigned. 49 was assigned. 47 is assigned from 42. Can you clarify which one you want? Because I don't want to spend time on one that wasn't on the list. So 49 was assigned, but not 47. Get the differential equation, 4.131. Yeah, sure. All right. We'll grab this. Okay. And then bring that over here. I think it's funny how large it pastes it. I don't know if I have something resized or what. Oh, I bet it's the resolution. I bet the resolution, something about the resolution. Okay, whoa. So your question was primarily about just how to take the derivative of this, if that's, if I'm understanding here. Um, we have Boyle's law, P, V, whoops, I am red. I guess the red is not the end of the world, but. P V to the 1.4 equals K. Okay, K is a constant, that's important. P is pressure, V is volume. So neither of those are changing. Uh, at a given instant, the pressure is 20. So at that moment, the pressure is 20 kilograms per centimeter squared. The volume at that moment is 32 centimeters cubed. The volume is decreasing at a rate of two centimeters cubed per minute. That's the volume is decreasing. That's the rate of change of volume. And it's decreasing, so negative centimeter, negative two centimeters cubed per minute. Does anyone know why I'm emphasizing for the P and the V that it's at that given instant, at that moment? Do you know why I'm emphasizing that, that phrase there for the P and the V? Because they're not constant, they're the ones that actually were changing. That's correct, exactly. So we do not want to plug them in to the equation, right? We'll do that later, but right now we do not want to plug them in. So you have a couple options right now. Um, you want to differentiate both sides with respect to T. Um, you could, if you wanted to, you're saying at what rate is the pressure changing? So you want to try to find dP dt. You could, if you wanted to, solve for P and, and divide by V to the 1.4. And so you have P equals K over V to the 1.4. That's fine. Um, and then if I would, I think that's actually not a bad idea, then you could write it K times V to the negative 1.4. So this is optional. If you don't do this and you use the original equation, what are you going to have to do when you differentiate with respect to T? So if you leave it P times V to the 1.4, how are, 
yeah, uh, not chain rule. Nope. Nope. Maybe you know the right thing, but that's not the right word. <laughs> so it's not the chain rule. No. There's a different rule. Implicit differentiation. That's what we're doing. True. Oh. That is true. You're right. But with, I'm thinking specifically on that left-hand side. Use the product rule. Product rule is correct. We'd have to use the product rule, which is okay. Like that's fine. You can use the product rule. That's fine. The benefit. Yep. That's right, Alexis. So the benefit of solving for P first is now when I differentiate both sides with respect to T, um, I can just use the power rule. So it's a little bit simpler. Uh, the left side is DP DT. Uh, the right side is, let's see, negative 1.4 K V to the negative 2.4 times DV DT. Well, it's kind of interesting too. By doing that, we don't need to know P. Hmm. And again, the product rule we would, we would need to know it there. Interesting. Um, and so now we just plug in, I think we have the K, we have the V, um, we have, do we have DV, DT? Yep, we have DV, DT. And so just uh, plug everything in. And that should do it. Uh, and I know if I understood your question correctly, Sandra, you are focused on, or Chantel, Chantel was um, focused on just getting the differential equation. Yeah, I was trying to do it as the quotient rule where I had K over V to the 1.4. Uh, when I was doing the math of it out, it was, I wasn't getting the right answer. So I wasn't, I kept going back and I was trying to figure out what I did wrong. Yeah, you can do that. Let me show you how to do that. A lot of people mix this up and I think I know why because I've been seeing this pretty often. So that would be the denominator V to the 1.4 times the derivative of the numerator. Yeah. Minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator over the denominator squared. Uh, and the key is that the derivative of K is zero. And so you lose that whole first term is just gone. And so you get negative K at times, uh, let's see, 1.4 V to the 0 0.4 times DV DT. That's over V to the 2.8. And if you simplify that, you will get the same thing, negative 1.4 uh, K V to the, oops, 2.8. I was getting ahead of myself, 2.8. When you subtract that, be negative 2.4 and then DV DT. So the quotient rule does work, but the key for that is that that first term, the derivative of the numerator is just zero. And so the quotient rule is kind of, it's just extra work. It does work though, it does work, but it's, it's inefficient. So it's better to treat that K as a constant and then just multiply, multiply by the V to the negative 1.4. That's always gonna be easier. Yeah. Uh, Lorenzo, you had a question? Yeah, what was K? So if like we were gonna plug in like the uh, values. I yeah, I think we just, it's probably just the answer is gonna be in terms of K. Oh, and I see, so I see that's why we need the P. So if we need K, then we can go back to the original here K is equal to P times V to the 1.4. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So if we did the product rule, we don't need K because the derivative of K is zero. If we don't use the product rule, we do need K. And the key is P times V to the 1.4 is K. And so we have the P at that moment is 20. And the V at that moment is 32 to the 1.4. So the K is whatever that is. Yeah, good question. I didn't think about that consequence of, of solving for P is then you need to figure out K. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, good question. That's a good catch. Yeah, if you do the product rule, you lose the K, 
And so you don't actually need to solve for the K. Good. Any other questions on um, homework? Any other homework related questions? All right, 37 from 4.1. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. Get some more space here. And let's find that 37. This is one that's going to be similar. Oh, do we do? We did one almost identical to this. So you can also, we'll get a good start on this one here. And you can also look at uh, the last class period. We did one just like this. Um, I think it was the last one. Remember this one? The beacon and the lighthouse, one kilometer from the shore. It's revolving five times per minute. Uh, and so this one is really similar to that. A radar antenna moving one revolution every five seconds is located on a ship that is six kilometers from a straight shoreline. So let's draw or straight shoreline, that's the shore. We have a ship out here, fancy ship. Okay, there's my ship. Uh, it is six kilometers from the shore. Um, how fast is the radar be moving along the shoreline when the beam makes an angle of 45 degrees with the shore? You know what, I actually don't want to label 45 degrees on there. Does anyone know why I do not want to label 45 degrees on the picture, but I did label the six? That's not constant. That's right, Sandra. So let's call that theta. It's not constant. The six is constant though. The six is constant. Um, yes, sir. I've been seeing examples in the book where mm -hmm. the angle, they'll have theta where we start right by 6K and then there'll be another angle at the shoreline and they'll subtract that angle from, is that the same thing that we've been doing or would that give us a different answer? Um, let's see here, let me check. Oh, you are right. We labeled it the wrong way. So we just, we need to be careful. I, I would say we should label one theta um, and it depends on where that is. And you look here, how fast is the radar be moving along the shoreline when the beam makes a 45 degree angle with the shore? Aha. So we just labeled it in the wrong spot. So we wanna label it correctly in one spot. And I think we should only need to label one. Yeah, we should only need to label one. So that was a really good catch on that one, Christopher. Um, there's one other thing we need to label. That's another thing that's changing. That's going to be important to the problem. Does anyone know the other thing we need to label? Revolutions. That's going to be important, but it's not labeling on the picture. But this is definitely something one revolution per five seconds. It's definitely going to be important. It's going to be the X along the shoreline. Yeah, something along the shoreline. You can label it whatever you like. I like to use X there. That was a good idea. However you want to label it, but it's, it's the distance along the shoreline because that's what we're looking for. Um, we're looking to, you can see here, how fast is the radar be moving along the shoreline? So we are asked to find dx dt. That's what we are looking to find. Um, but I think Lorenzo, is, this is really important information. It's making one revolution every five seconds. Oh, that's a problem there because that's the revolution over here. Ooh, so maybe Christopher is right. Maybe we do need two angles. So this one is not the same as the one we did because the angle is the angle with the shoreline. So I was going to say that this one revolution is something about d theta dt, but it is not. It is not d theta dt. No, it is not d theta dt. We need another angle over here. And then somehow, somehow we need to relate those angles and x and oh, yuck. Okay, 
we got some more thinking to do. Um, let's start with this. Can we get a relationship between x and theta? Can we start with that? Yes. What are you thinking, Sandra? Cosine of theta. Well, well, we can do tangent instead of cosine. Okay, tangent theta, and sounds good. What would that be equal to? Six over x. Sounds good, all right. Uh, and you can use cotangent if you want, either tangent or cotangent. So that's good. Um, we can even differentiate that, but we're gonna need more information. Let me just, let's just do that now. And we will see, we will get to a point where we will get stuck here. Uh, is it okay if I write this as six X to the negative one? So then I don't need to do the quotient rule. I can just do the power rule, if that's easier. Um, derivative of tangent, got that one memorized yet? Mr. Kerner? Yes, sir. I labeled the theta at the bottom angle and the 45 at the right angle and it came out to the right answer. Um, but it's not constant up here. So that's my concern is that that's not always 45 up there. Okay. Yeah, so it might be coincidental, it might be lucky. So let's just, I think, I think it's, I think that will always work, but I wanna make sure we understand why. All right. Yes, yes. So um, we were looking at derivative of tangent. So who remembers that? By the way, did I tell you, you can just press space bar to unmute yourself and then you can talk and then let go of the space bar. You don't have to click the unmute button. Somebody discovered that in one of my classes. Secant squared. Secant squared is correct. Secant squared theta. And then we need d theta dt. And then we'll have negative six x to the negative second and then dx dt. Okay, so this is pretty good. Uh, we have secant squared theta. Um, I like to rewrite those in terms of cosine. So one over cosine squared theta, d theta dt equals negative six over x squared dx dt. And if we wanna solve for dx dt, we can just multiply by negative x squared over six on both sides. dx dt. Okay, so we need three things. We need x squared, we need cosine theta, we need d theta dt. Do we have any of those? No, <laughs> we don't have, we don't have any of those. So somehow, let me write down, whoops, let me write down what we have, the picture down here again. We have x, we know uh, this is six. We marked theta over here. This is a right angle. Um, boy, we know at that particular moment, theta is 45 degrees. So at that particular moment, what's x? But I know that if that's 45 degrees over there. You're making it too hard. It's a 45, 45 triangle. Six. Thank you. It's six, that's correct. It is six. So we know X is six, that's good. Negative six squared over six. Um, how can we get cosine? Pythagorean theorem? Uh, oh, we could, we could. You are correct. We don't need to be that fancy, but we could. Uh, six squared plus six squared is, the 
uh, 72, square root of 72. Well, this is a 45, so six square root of two. And then cosine would be adjacent over hypotenuse, but you should recognize that one over square root of two because it's 45. So you could also have done that. So that's one over square root of two squared. So the last thing that we're stuck with, and this gets to Christopher's question, is about theta. And does it matter if we use where we put theta and what we call d theta dt? So this is one of these things where you can get it right with not really understanding why, I think. Um, the key uh, for d theta dt is that theta plus, we'll call this one over here, we'll call this one like angle A. Theta plus A plus nine, or equals 90, right? The, t the sum of them together have to equal 90. And so then when I differentiate both sides with respect to T, there's this direct relationship between the two, uh, d theta dt plus dA dt has to equal zero, and d theta dt is the opposite of dA dt. You see, when you have angles in a triangle and one of them is 90, if one angle gets bigger, the other angle has to get smaller at exactly the same rate because the triangle can't get more than 180 degrees. So these two angles, you know, if one gets bigger, the other has to get smaller. If one gets bigger at two degrees per second, the other has to get smaller at two degrees per second if the third angle is a right angle because you can't, you have to keep it at 180 degrees. So you might just, that might just get lucky and like plug that in here, even though um, you don't know why, and it's really subtle, but I, I thought that would be worth discussing. Um, and the dA dt, that's the one that is uh, five revolutions per second. No, one revolution per five seconds. One revolution per five seconds, right? Isn't that what that one was? One revolution per five seconds. Um, and the, the, the problem with positive or negative here is it doesn't tell us a direction. So it really could be positive or negative. We don't know. We actually, I drew it this way. But it could have just as easily been on the other side and then moving in. Or maybe it's moving the whole other orientation. Maybe it's spinning the other direction. So the positive negative is really not a big deal here. Um, it's not like moving up or down. They don't give us any information about the angles. So it's not um, as big of a challenge as it usually is. Um, but I need to get rid of these revolution units. I need to change those units. Uh, does anyone know what we should use instead? I feel like we did this in our example too. We use radians. Yeah, that's correct. So one revolution will be two pi radians. So I think we are finally done. This will be negative two pi over five. Um, if we put in the units there, what will happen is all of our units will work out. We don't have units written in the problem, but they would all work out nicely. Um, so let's see here, negative six squared over six, that's negative six, one over one half times negative two pi over five. Uh, negative six times two times negative two pi over five. So what do we have, 24 pi over five? And I believe our units then would be kilometers because that's our unit here for the distance from the shoreline and it would be per second. We can double check here. Uh, where did my answers go? I 
31. No, that wasn't 31. What one was that one? 37. So it's number 37. 37. I think I'm like 31 is the volume one. Hey, nice. Looks like they did it the same way we did. All right, so tangent theta equals x over six. Everything looks the same. We did that. Um, d theta dt, they didn't do as much work on the d theta dt. Um, they just assumed that that d theta dt for the theta over here was equal to the rate of change of the angle over here. They didn't really explain that though. Uh, so the rest of the stuff they just kind of plugged in and so they didn't do as much work. Look at their drawing. See, they, they put the theta over here, but the question was saying that this angle over here was 45 degrees, right? So, but it ended up being fine. You know what? I think the better way to have done this one was to, since we had information about theta, about the angle of rotation of the radar, use that d theta dt, and then use the information in that moment, it's 45 degrees over here, so that implies that theta is also 45. I think that makes more sense rather than trying to convert between the, the rate of change of the two angles. Use the information that we were given, that we were given that the um, radar was moving at a rate of one revolution for every five seconds and put that variable where it's moving and then just figure it out at the end, even though we were given 45 degrees with the shoreline, um, label the theta still as the one where it's uh, where the radar is. I think that makes more sense there. Okay, I want to take some time. We've been spending like all of last time and most of this time on 4.1 examples. Um, we need to also talk about uh, 4.2 and 4.3. We do have Thursday. We do have Thursday, but it'd be nice to do a couple today to get you thinking about that. Um, Can you go over 61 from 4.2, the piecewise function. Um, maybe that's probably like the hardest one. <laughs> so near the end, the piecewise ones get a little challenging. Uh, Chantel is asking about volume formulas. You do not need to have those memorized. So do not worry about memorizing all the volume formulas. So I think 61 is a good problem, but it might, when the, when, once you get piecewise and you're looking for absolute max and min, that's like an extra layer of difficulty there. Let's just draw the picture for this one. Here. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, weird. Like pasted it, no, paste it down here. There we go. This one, I might just, yeah, I don't know if we need a lot of fancy calculus with this one. Um, we're looking for, what are we looking for again? Find the absolute value, absolute maximum value and absolute minimum value on the interval. So I think this one, we should just draw it. We should just draw it. So 2x plus 1. Uh, let me switch here. Uh, we don't need all that. We just need the right-hand side, right? 2x plus 1. Uh, y intercept up at 1. Slope of 2. Let me actually get rid of that dot. I just want to get rid of that dot. Nope, I got rid of everything. 
Let me do that one. I'll do that one maybe in red. Y-intercept of one, slope of two, up two over one. Okay, and then three X, when Y, when X is between one and three, well, three X goes to the origin, slope is three, one, two, three over one, one, two, three over one. So like that, and then we need to trim and just take the parts that we want from each. So let me draw it again. I think I need to make my Y axis. I don't know if I'm gonna have enough here. That'll be close. Um, so we want the red from zero to one. So that's just um, zero, one, and then one, it's up at three. So there's that line. And then we want the, the green from one to three. And so that's three and then six and then nine. It looks like a straight line here, it really isn't. I'm just not great at, at sketching those. Cause this one, the first part should have a slope of two and the second part should have a slope of three. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a straight line. We could do we could do a quick decimals graph for that one. That might be best. Y equals two x plus one when x is between zero and one, and then y equals three x when x is between one and three. Yeah, see, Desmos does a better job than I do. That looks better. Right? That looks steeper for the second part. Definitely. And so, boy, with the picture, it seems pretty obvious. What's the absolute minimum? Where does that, where does that occur or what is it? One. One, right? Right here. And then what's the absolute maximum? Three. Or four. Yeah. Three. Uh, nope, because I need the whole, both the blue and the red. So it's the whole function together. That's the maximum of the red, but we need, we want the whole graph. So if I go back to my crummy one, we want the maximum of this whole graph. It would be three nine. Yeah, it'd be over here. The, the absolute maximum is nine when X is three. So you wouldn't accept it if we said that the um, the absolute is three because I was saying three from X. Would you say F of three? Instead? Yeah, yeah, that's a quite that's a good question. A lot of students, this is really common. Is this like the the verbs and how do we describe it? Um, so the absolute maximum is nine. So when you talk about what is the maximum, it's the absolute maximum of Y values. So it's a Y value. So the absolute maximum is nine. Where does it occur? Well, it occurs when X is equal to three. So it would be, it would be mathematically, technically incorrect if we said the absolute max is three, but that's where the absolute max occurs. It's a really subtle language. It's such a language issue. Yep, so let's look at the way the question is worded. I believe it's asking for, find the absolute maximum value. I'm trying to like highlight it and you can't see, but the absolute maximum value and the absolute minimum value. So those are Y values, those are Y values. Cool. All right, so that's one example from uh, 4.2. Any other questions from 4.2 or 4.3? Could you go back to the um, image of the graph? Uh -huh. You want the nice one or mine? <laughs> uh, yours. Okay. <laughs> and so the first part here, is the 2x plus one has a y-intercept at one 
and then goes up two to the right one. Um, that has a slope of two. And then for three X, uh, it, it, we can just plot some points there. When X is one, it's three. When X is two, it's six. When X is three, it's nine. And so that's the second line. The reason why they look straight, I think is because like my first jump here is bigger than the rest. It's all about tick marks and whether you're consistent, then your graphs can just look totally off if you're not super consistent with how you mark them. Uh, the X axis can be bigger than the Y axis. They just have to be consistent. And that, that's hard to do by hand. Could you go over 71? Let's see here. Or point two. Uh huh. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think after this, we will call it a day after this one. Uh, for Thursday, you want to have all of the homework done. I mean, you can wait if you have to, I guess, but you ideally want to have all of the homework done before we meet so you can come and have questions um, and bring your questions that you have on 4.1, 4.2, 4.3. And it looks like we're taking up most of our time with homework questions. That's fine. Uh, if we do need extra examples, I have some prepared from those sections and we can do those on Thursday. So what we have here is a function for the cost of driving a truck at a particular speed. Um, so the question is, is what is the most economical speed? So economical speed means we want the minimum, I can spell, minimum cost. Um, just as a quick point of reference, let's use our tools. Um, mm -hmm. We can graph it, right? Cost equals, it was 3.6 times, what was it 2,500 over X plus X? I think I'm typing that correctly. Let me make sure here. Uh, where did it go? There it is, 2,500 over X, yep. Um, and then we need, I gotta zoom out here, where is this function? There it is, okay. Uh, we really, we could just look from X going from, we'll say negative five to 80, All right? So there, somewhere there is the minimum. Oh, it looks like it picks it up. So it looks like it's gonna be at 50 and 360. Um, and Desmos has picked out the minimum for us. So we wanna prove it, right? We wanna prove definitively that 50 is the ideal speed. Um, so, oh, we did graph it here. We use technology. By the way, this technology icon there means that when it has graphing calculator, graph it with technology. So we're good, we're good with B. We have it graphed. Uh, what Good is question. the most, ec oh yeah, go ahead. When I read most economical speed, I thought of maximum. Right, right. Yeah, so this is another language thing, but if something's economical, then it's the cheapest. Thank so you. it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, a lot of these, boy, that wording is really subtle. It is definitely subtle, yeah. So most economical, we really wanna have the minimum. Um, we're gonna use the interval 10 to 75, so we need to check the cost at 10, just manually plug those in, and the cost at 75. So we'll just need to evaluate those. By the way, you can do that in Desmos as well. If I make this a function, C of X, then I can type C of 10 and C of 75. So much easier than a calculator. You can do this on a calculator, but it's more tedious. So 390 at 75, 936 at 10. So very, very expensive at 10. Um, a lot cheaper at 75, okay? But we do know there's, it looks to be that there's one more in the middle that's even cheaper. So we need to find the derivative and look for critical numbers, uh, 3.60. And then the 2,500 over X, I'm gonna write that as 2,500 X to the negative one. So that's negative 2,500 X to the negative second plus one. And we wanna set that equal to zero to find the critical numbers. 3.60, 0, 
negative 2,500 over x squared plus 1 equals 0. Um, we could divide by 3.6, so that just goes away. And then we have negative 2,500 over x squared plus 1 is equal to 0. Um, we could multiply both sides by x squared, maybe. I don't know. There's different things you could do here. Add 2,500, x squared equals 2,500, and hey, there's our 50, right? Normally it would be plus or minus 50, but we're doing speed, and I'm pretty sure the truck is not going to drive backwards at 50 miles per hour or whatever it is. It's miles per hour, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's not going to drive backwards at 50 miles per hour. Um, the only thing we need to check is it's possible that that's a maximum. So it's possible that it could start at 10, go up, and then end up minimum at 75. So that is definitely theoretically possible. So we need to make sure that the cost at 50 is actually the minimum. So we need to plug that in. Cost at 50, oops, not five, that's even worse. 50, 360, so a little bit cheaper than 75. So the absolute minimum, is this like weekly cost or something? 360 at uh, 50 miles per hour. So you notice the verbiage there to Christopher's earlier question about that. The absolute minimum is $360. So that's, that is the actual minimum value. Where did the um, minus terms come from for the 2,500? Um, taking the derivative when you have 2,500x to the negative first. So I wrote it 2,500 divided by x. And then when you use the power rule, when you take the derivative, um, it, the derivative of that with respect to x um, is negative. So you multiply the exponent times the coefficient, and you get negative 2,500 x to the negative second. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, and Lorenzo, you had a question too? Lorenzo? Oh, there you go, I wasn't letting me unmute myself. No, it's all good. Yeah, I'm confused how you went from the negative 2,500 over x squared plus one equals zero to negative 2,500 plus x squared equals zero. Sure. What I did there is I multiplied both sides by x squared, but I just did it all in my head without telling you what I was doing. I don't know why you can't read my mind. <laughs> and then when you distribute times the first, you lose the x squared, so all you're left with is negative 2,500. And then when you distribute to the second, you get the x squared. And then on the right-hand side, x squared times zero is just zero. Oh, okay, because I was thinking of like, subtracting the one. You can do that, right too. Side. Yeah. You can do that. Yep. So you can do that. And then you could, um, then you could multiply by X squared if you wanted. Mm -hmm. And then divide by negative one and you get at the same spot. So there's a variety of methods that would work there. Okay. Now I see it. Cool. All right. I gotta go. I got kids coming to the door. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to post this recording. Now a second kid has come to the door. Just wait. <laughs> um, so for Thursday, focus on homework from 4.2 and 4.3 uh, and 4.1, of course, if you, if you haven't done that yet. Um, come with questions. Let's uh, make sure we answer all your homework questions. If you need to, like, boy, we burned a lot of time today on like four questions. So use that discussion thread. Use that, um, uh, the Discord chat. Post there. Um, you know, some of your classmates will hopefully be able to pop in. And then after class on Thursday, I will post the quiz in PDF form, and then you could submit that. Uh, and it will not be homework problems this time. It will be similar even problems, but it will be open homework notebook quiz. So that's kind of cool. You can have your homework notebook, notebook open. Um, and it's just because we kind of changed with the formatting. I don't want to have the homework there kind of tempting you to look at it. All right, that's it. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. It's going to be beautiful out. Get outside, have some fun. You get to see these guys. They're just like waiting here by the door, like just waiting very patiently <laughs> for me to be done. So I got to go. I'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody.